listening to The Trauma Beat, hosted by me, Tamara Cherry. Check the show notes for anything that might activate your own trauma responses. And as always, like, subscribe, leave a review or a comment. Do what you can if you like what you hear. Episode 6, my conversation with homicide survivor, Shauna Brown. Okay, so Shauna, um, why don't you just start out by introducing yourself? Um, Okay, so my name is Shauna Brown. Um, I am a mother of three. And I lost my son, Damal Graham, to gun violence on July 23rd of 2017. Um, Since then, we've been dealing with the grief and the whole grieving process and the journey that comes along with it. And what a journey that has been for you, I know. Can you start out maybe by telling us a little bit about Damal? Um, yes, of course. Um, I love to talk about him. He um, he was an angel. He was a loving, kind-hearted person. Even from the time he was a little boy, he had he was very sensitive, um, just very caring and loving. Family was of utmost importance to him, especially myself and his sisters and siblings, and specifically his daughter. Um, he was a very, very creative person, very, very creative, whether it be art, whether it be music. Uh, he was also extremely, extremely funny and very, very passionate about making music. He utilized making music as a way to deal with some of the uh, mental health issues that he um, experienced throughout life, like depression and anxiety. So um, he utilized um, a lot of his energy went into his music and explaining his experiences and um, trying to share those with people. That must be a nice thing for you to have as a as a re, as a reminder of him. Thanks so much for sharing those yeah. little bits of Damal with us, Shauna. Um, I'd like to now, if if you're comfortable, go back to when Damal died, and specifically talking about the media. What can you tell me about your first recollection of the media after Damal died? To be honest, the first recollection, I remember specifically after he had died that the um, police, victim services, things like that were telling me, you know, stay away from the news, stay away from the media because it would just kind of make, make the situation worse, which I did. I did stay away from, because I also knew that we hadn't released his name yet. So, um, and I was right there reeling in, you know, everything. So um, I, I, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, So I didn't really have any direct impact or interaction with them initially. I do remember them staying outside of the front of the house because he was killed in our driveway. So I do remember cars being outside in the front, um, especially when it happened. But even, you know, like the day after, two days after, excuse me, there were cars still there with media. I remember my one daughter who was um, trying to get out of the house just to get out of the house, just to go and, you know, have clear her head and stuff like that. And I remember people like following her to the car, trying to ask her questions. So um, in in that sense, it I, I didn't feel the immediate pressures, but I also didn't feel safe enough walking out the front of my house because there were media there and I couldn't even go out and even be at the place and where Damal had died um, mm-hmm. and just have my moment because all eyes were on me kind of thing. So that was my first experience um, initially w- with the media. What what impact did that have on you, Shauna? The fact that, you know, you were, you were in a sense, and we've sort of talked about this in a previous conversation, a prisoner in your own home during, during these first few difficult days. It was, it was hard. It was extremely hard. It was, you know, you're kind of feeling like you're caged in. Um, I was also, you know, very leery of my surroundings and everything. So I was very resistant at times to even let my daughters go out of the house, just that, that, that fear of safety, uh, because we didn't know, you know, any details as to who, who that kind of thing. So my whole world was shattered. So we were just overly protective of everything. Um, but it, it was hard. I mean, eventually they, they did 
disperse and they were um, no longer there, but um, just their presence and just knowing that we had to, you know, even at one time go out through the back door so that they couldn't see us going to the parking lot to, to, to hassle us. Um, and yeah, so in, in, in that sense, that was kind of hard because as I said, and it was the summertime too. So it, it's not like it was winter. It was the summertime where you could be out enjoying the nice weather and, and stuff like that. But um, I just kind of stayed inside and stayed away from the, the media and all of that. Shauna, why was it so important to you that Damal's name not be released publicly right away? It was extremely important for me um, because my main priority at that point was protecting the innocence um, of my granddaughter. And I wanted to make sure that I had a conversation or her mom and I had a conversation with her explaining what had happened to her dad. Um, that to me was of utmost importance because she was his main priority and that um and although yes it does impact the loss of him impacts on me i also know that it had a huge huge impact on my six-year-old granddaughter at the time so it was very important that we did it on our own terms and that um i didn't release his name until after i had um, told her that her dad had passed can you imagine um if his name had been released right away. And I want to ask you this question, Shauna, because sometimes the media, you know, they want as much information as they can get as, as quickly as possible. But yeah. can you imagine what the impact would have been on you if Damal's name was released, say, within 24 hours? Because if I remember correctly, it was two or three days before police put out his name officially. Uh, if it had been released immediately and if, if your granddaughter somehow would have found out because of that before you could have that con before you were ready to have that conversation with her? Um, I think it would have been disastrous, to be honest with you. I think that the um, one of the things that I have really prided myself on, as difficult as this journey has been, has been protecting my family and protecting um, my daughters and my granddaughter and trying to get them through the grieving process with as little um, influence or interference from, from the outside world. So um, I definitely think that had they released the information earlier um, or had released his name earlier, that it would have, the impact would have just been completely different. Um, and because of the way that we did do it, I was able to get the ball rolling in terms of other media to make sure that the light that was painted about my son was not a stereotype or a, like um, a statistic, even though, I mean, yes, he was a statistic in terms of the murder, but um, making sure that, that we kind of had a handle on the media. So let's talk about that now, because you had a close family friend, if I remember correctly, speak to the media on your behalf after Damal died. Can you tell me first how that was helpful for you, having somebody there to speak, to get your message out without you yourself having to do those initial interviews? Um, yeah, the there was um, a specific article that was done in the Metro paper, um, the Scarborough paper. And to be honest, I didn't even know that um, this that um, this friend had done the had had done the interview. Okay, so it was it was actually a, a great surprise um, for me because. Um, she talked about, you know, Damal and, and, you know, how he was a, you know, positive in, in terms of being in the community, how he was a great father and painted a completely different light, um, not a different light. They painted the light that I wanted them to paint of him. And that's what I wanted him to be remembered by, not um, a statistic or because we grew or because we lived in a high priority neighborhood and crime was high, those kinds of things. I wanted to make sure that his legacy right from the time, you know, um, also especially being very cognizant of the fact that as my daughter, as my granddaughter gets older, she can Google his name and she can search up those things. So I wanted to make sure that when she does that, that things out there are, are put in a positive light um, yeah. re regarding my son. So um, in that sense, I think that that was kind of a sigh of relief, that article, just because it um, I've seen so many other situations where it doesn't end up that way and it's very traumatizing. So I'm glad that we were able to um, take the reins and, and, and do what we needed to do with regards to the media.
So you had told me, and, and you just touched on it there, that, that very soon after Damal died, you were very cognizant of how that narrative can, could go. Can you, yes. can you tell me a little bit more about that, what your thought process was given the media coverage you had seen of other young men who had been killed in your neighborhood in the past? Um, well, it, it boils down to the, um, you know, my fear was that his past criminal record um, was going to be brought into play. Uh, the common saying that always that, that gets put into the newspaper or, or media is known to police. Um, so I was worried about that. Um, he had turned his life around. I mean, everybody, you know, makes mistakes and stuff, but I didn't want that to be um, the reason or like, I didn't want that to be the focal point of uh, of the situation. I didn't want it to be that they were talking about his criminal background and mm -hmm. painting him a picture uh, in a sense, almost as if, oh, well, you know, he deserved it kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and that's kind of, you know, the feeling when those terms are thrown around or that they've been in trouble with the law, um, you know, they, they come from broken family or whatever the case is, it, it still doesn't justify somebody losing their life. So, um, and, and that was, you know, and, and, and that's important. So that was my, that was my biggest fear. Um, and also too, my, my other bigger fear as well too, was making sure that the, the picture that was released was a picture that was released by me. It wasn't a, a picture that the police took of, you know, from mugshot picture, from something. a mugshot picture, yeah. which, which, which they often do. So okay. those were my biggest fears was that he wasn't going to be painted in a light in, in, in the proper light. Um, you, you've, you've told me in a previous conversation that you think that a lot of mothers don't come forward after their black sons are murdered because of that narrative. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Um, well, yeah, most definitely. I think um, we, I raised my family in the Malvern area for almost 13 years, right up until the time that Damal was killed. And quite often there were, I mean, I've, I've even seen myself, I mean, Damal's biracial. So um, I, I've seen where there were times where he was being, you know, questioned by police. And then, um, but as soon as I come onto the picture, then it's a completely different kind of thing. So you see the harassment, you see, you know, some of the negative things that, that happen, um, unless you're, you know, willing to kind of step up and take, take a stand for yourself. Um, and a lot of times too, to touch on the other point where moms mothers don't come forward um there's a lot of reasons why moms don't come forward and you know one is the, the grieving is just way too much it's just too much for them it's it's also to the way that um our sons are painted in in the media's you know light kind of thing that as i said almost as if they deserved it or oh they lived that life so that's it was bound to happen every situation every every um, journey is different. So you can't say one is the same to the other. They have some common similarities, but not everything is the same. And another reason too, is because it's, it's very frustrating to put your name out there and to fight for justice for your child. It's, it's very time consuming and it's very overwhelming, especially when there's a large majority of these murders that can be solved, but people choose not to come forward and, and choose to place, to be silent and be complacent, you know, figuring, oh, it's not in my neighborhood. It's not, you know, that kind of thing. But um, yeah. And a lot of these murders that are un they're un, I wouldn't say they're unsolved because we know who, you know, in a lot of cases, we know who the perpetrators are. It's just that they haven't been brought to justice yet. And that process is a very long process. The way victims get treated, um, in my opinion, is, is horrendous even throughout the criminal process so a lot of people in dealing with their own grief already have too much on their plate and then you add a criminal trial and all of that you know everything else on top of it too it, it becomes extremely overwhelming. I wonder if I can ask you Shauna I hadn't put this on the list but you just reminded me of it in something that you just said and that is about the experience that you had and we don't need to name the media outlet but you had reached out to me about something uh, I think it was earlier this year where uh, you had attended an event um, talking about gun violence and a reporter had asked you to share your story about Damal, about what happened. Um, 
And, and then the story didn't end up running that she, she basically emailed you a couple hours later and said she got reassigned and it's not going to run. At least that, that was what initially happened. Can you maybe tell me um, why that was so hurtful for you? Uh, the experience of having to relive your trauma and then be told that it might not see the light of day. Um, yeah, it's, it, that was difficult because um, the questions that are being asked and we're, we're pouring out our, you know, our, our personal stories in the hope that we can inspire and motivate and make changes. So the fact that um, myself, along with another mother, did that, and we talked about our sons, we shared pictures. So those are very intimate kinds of things. And then it was just kind of put on the back burner. Now, one of the things that um, happen a lot, quite often with with trauma survivors, is the fact that, um, as I said, as I spoke earlier, that our world feels very uncertain, and um, so we need to know at times that when somebody's going to do something, that they're going to follow through on it because that increases our our, our trust. But when in in that sense, it was like a, a complete lack of trust. Like you know, another story got. Um, you know, it was more important. Um, and it was actually me following up with them to find out what was going to happen and me advocating for myself and for the other mom to basically say, you can't do that to people. You can't ask them to pour their hearts out and, and bring something that is so traumatizing to them and talk about it and then just put it on the back burner as if it didn't matter. So, um, yeah, that, that one, and I'm glad that it did work out the way that it did. I think eventually they did release mm -hmm. something, um, not everything that was supposed to, but they did release something. After but again, getting a bit of a kick in the butt though thanks to yeah. your advocacy work so you yeah. you should be commended because you are I should point out to anybody watching this Shauna you're an incredible advocate for homicide mm -hmm. survivors um, and you've really been one of those survivors to who's taken her own pain and recognized it in other people and said that this is not okay and this is what needs to be done which brings us to this conversation of course yes. um, can you tell me Shauna how you're impacted by the media coverage of other homicides by gun violence. Because I think that there is perhaps um, a misperception, a misconception by the public and by members of the media that, well, I'm not talking about her case, so this wouldn't have an impact on her. But can you tell me a little bit about that impact of seeing the media coverage of other cases? Yes, most definitely. Um, well, unfortunately, since the murder of Damal, there's been, um, you know, quite a few <laughs> murders. Um, and unfortunately, there's been um, some of those have been people that I've known. So um, looking at the media, like the the coverage and things like that, but it's, it's very triggering. It's it, it, it brings me right back. Um, you know, in grief, we, we have our ebbs and flows. And there's times where I'm doing really, really great. And I'm advocating and I'm feeling really strong. And then there's times when, um, you you know, you, you kind of hit that rock bottom and you're dealing with all the, all the grief of, of all of that. So um, it, it gets difficult. Yeah. Um, put me back on track. Cause I, we, we, we talk about that word triggering a lot in these, in these conversations about trauma informed journalism. And I wonder if you might be able to expand on that because even this conversation we're having right now, um, we're not talking about the event that brought us here but I am uh, very cognizant that this can be one of those conversations that brings you down. When you see something in the media that is triggering for you, can you describe for me what impact that has on your body, on your mind, and how long you can be brought down for? Is it that moment and then you get back to living your, your normal life? Yeah. Or does it last longer than that? Sort of try to bring us into that moment or moments if you can. Um, again, it, it depends on the, like, if I'm seeing something on the news, it depends on the, um, on, on the coverage and my, um, relationship to it. For example, as I said, I've had other people that I've known, um, that have, that have been murdered by gun through gun violence. And, um, I also see, you know, like, uh, 
there's been a few cases where um, my daughters, their friends have been killed. So I see the impact on them. Um, and the, the trauma, it just, it, it just, it brings me right back to that place where you're just, you know, you're feeling hopeless, you're feeling just down, you're feeling that, you know, just uncertain about the, the entire world that, you know, like, is there ever going to be any kind of peace or, you know, like happiness or joy again? Mm -hmm. um, and then you also deal with a lot of guilt too, because on the good days, it's, you know, should I be having a good day? Like, but, you know, um, but the, in, in terms of how long it lasts, it really depends. There's times where um, I can see that I'm going into a, a, de a depressive mode and, you um, over the years, I've learned to um, accept them, embrace them, learn from them. Um, it's taken me a long time to be able to do that um, and and honor them because it, it is part of who I am and it's part of what I'm going through. And um, I think it's very important that I go through the motions and feel all that I need to feel. Um, and usually for me, I kind of hit a rock bottom and, and then I just out of nowhere kind of bounce up and, and I'm off to the races, but um, physically, I mean, you know, in terms of the depression where you just lack of motivation, lack of energy, just that hopeless feeling um, physically, um, there's also that too, like just the anxiety, the tension, um, the lack of sleep, the inability to sleep, the, and the list goes on. Yeah. And these are all things that can be brought up by one thing in the media, an image, uh, yeah. an interview, that sort of thing. Yeah. What advice, Shauna, would you give to other homicide survivors who are faced with media attention? I would say stand your ground and hold your own and don't be bullied by, um, by the media. Um, create your own narrative the way that, that I was able to, to as, as best as you can. I know that in some situations and circumstances that, you know, that, that people can't, um, that the media kind of gets a, ahead of it, but if at all possible to try to, um, you know, stand your ground and create your own narrative of how you want the story to be played out. Um, because it's unfortunate that when it happens, you get all the media attention for the first couple of days. And then once the name's released, then it's on to the next story. And I didn't want that to be my son. I didn't want to, oh, we're on to the next one. No, he deserved more than that. So um, I, and that's why I created my own narrative and I, and, and if all possible for other people to do the same thing. Wonderful. What about um, advice that you might have for survivor support workers? And by that, I mean, anybody who might be in a traditional victim services role, uh, whether in the community or in the courts, which I know you haven't had a, an opportunity to go through the courts yet, uh, or even an investigator. I know you had a positive experience with, with the investigator on your case. What advice would you give to those sorts of people uh, who are looking to support survivors of homicide with the media? One of the things that I would say is tender, like tender care, <laughs> give, give people the, the care. Um, acknowledge their story. Don't ever say that you know exactly how they feel or anything like that, but empathize with them and um, and allow them to have a positive, I mean, I, it, in a situation of homicide, I know that there's not many positives and I don't, you know, but to have some kind of normalcy or some kind of positive positivity in the, in, in the process, I think that that also helps. So being able to um, include them in the piece in, 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 in any media, mm -hmm. um, ex, you know, showing them you know, what's going to be done before it, it gets done, if at all possible, because quite often we can give an interview. I've done interviews where I've given interviews and some of the words that I've said were not taken out of context, but the, the, the paragraph before the paragraph after didn't get put in. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 it's kind of loose end. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that it's important um, to really be cautious of, um, you know, the, uh, the feelings too of, the of the homicide victim yeah like, oh, sorry of, of, of the yeah of, well some some people consider themselves victims some people consider themselves survivors so yeah that word does work still um and what about any additional advice that you would offer to members of the media who are covering homicides um 
be kind. Like it's, th this is people's lives that we're dealing with. Uh, you know, once the story is, is over, we still have to live on with our lives. So when you're painting negative pictures or you're trying to sensationalize to get more views or to get that promotion or whatever, understand what you're, or why you're doing it and whose back you're climbing on to be able to do that. Um, and to treat, and to treat victims and survivors with the utmost respect for sharing their stories, for being able to even get their stories out. So some people, you know, can't even talk about their stories, let alone being able to advocate and being able to support others. And also, too, that I would also suggest that with the media, because of networking, that if they know of other moms or other services that, you know, where people can line up and, and meet with one another and be a support to another, that they also become a part of that as well, because that's huge. Peer support has been a huge, huge part of my healing and, and my growth, and it it's what gets gets me through on the hard days and it's what gets me through on the good days too. So um, that's huge and so very important. So what you're saying there is it would be helpful perhaps for journalists to try to help introduce you to other people to get you into those peer support roles. Is that what you mean? Well, or, or if they know of programs or initiatives yes. or, yep. and things that are going on that they, that you know, that again, that it's not just a story yes. that, you know, you're not, you know, covering a murder today and then you're, 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 you know, covering somebody that's, you know, had their dog stolen from them. There's two yes. different things there. So um, most definitely the networking. And I think that that would do a lot to um, help bring the relationship with the media closer together with victims and survivors. You raise such an excellent point, Shauna, because especially reporters who cover traumatic events on a regular basis, they are tuned in to those sorts of groups. They know other people and they might be one of the best resources to help out a survivor. And I think that sometimes journalists might feel like, well, that's overstepping my role. I would no longer be the objective journalist, but something I'm trying to show them is it's okay. It's okay to be a human being too. And yes. addition to and during the storytelling process. Um, Shauna, I wonder what does the term trauma-informed journalism mean to you? Um, it means that the journalists are aware of the of, of the trauma, potential triggers, and the impacts that it has on the victims and survivors. That's yeah. Be aware. So educate yeah, yourself humor. ahead of time. Yeah. Educate yourself. Yeah. Especially when, you know, for example, I, I remember shortly after I did a piece, um, an article for a, a paper and I had the, um, the reporter in the house. Mm. Now, um, we had one of those, like we had a house where like the pipe for outside, like sometimes it backfires. Mm. Um, and like, 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 like that gas sound or whatever. Mm. And I remember, um, him being there and him interviewing me, but both of us jumping at the same time. Mm. And mine was my PTSD, just the loud noise. And for him, so I think that, and, and I could tell that he was, he was shaken and I was like, oh, it's, it's okay. It's just, you know, you know, like the, the thing outside, but just the reaction. And if he had that reaction, imagine people that have that reaction and live that every single day that they have to, you know, a car's driving by slowly and they're turning and they're looking that somebody pops a juice box or a balloon on the ground, but somebody's triggered and turns around because they don't know if it's a gunshot or something else. Mm -hmm. So um, I think it's very important for people to, and journalists and reporters to understand, um, you know, triggers, but also trauma and, and how it impacts on the body and, um, and how it impacts on people. And also having some kind of follow-up depending on the content of the the communication or the the content of the um of the journalism or the piece that they're doing there should be some kind of follow-up you're asking somebody to potentially reveal such raw emotion and then just to okay thanks and wrap up the camera and off you go and that person sit is sitting there left with that. So I think that that's also a responsibility too, that if you're going to open up a can of worms in terms of feelings, that you also better be able to be prepared to help close that, that, that lid again too. That is such a valuable lesson and one that I wished I had learned while I was a journalist, because I can't tell you how many times, Shauna, I interviewed a homicide survivor 
like yourself and never talked to them again or only called them on the anniversary or when a reward was announced or, you know, something like that, because I actually felt like, you know, reintroducing myself to their li lives would bring them back to that awful time in those first few days. But what you just illustrated for us, for us is something that I have heard quite consistently from survivors. There are like, when I think about my research project, there are a very small handful of survivors in the dozens and dozens of homicide survivors that were part of this that said, don't follow up with me after this, after this survey. Uh, many of them said, yes, I would love to have a phone call with you or, or keep me updated or people wanted that extra contact. Um, and I, it's, it's something that I hold a lot of regret about from my days as a journalist, how many times I brought people to that danger zone, triggering mm -hmm. their trauma and then didn't take care of them after the fact or make sure that they were back in a, in a safe and more positive place. Um, is there anything else that you want to talk about Shauna or anything you feel we didn't cover? No, I think we covered quite a bit. Yeah. I, I think that your, I mean, your insight as always is uh, invaluable and so appreciated and just thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for having me. 